Hey everyone, my name is Kyla. Welcome to my channel where I talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. We're going to be talking about crypto narratives today. I apologize for the delay in uploads and also I apologize for being dressed like it's very cold outside because it is very cold outside. I'm currently in Colorado. It is negative two degrees and I'm not built for that lifestyle. Today I want to talk about crypto narratives from both inside and outside the ecosystem, the role of brands and financial institutions in building out crypto narratives, and finally how these two polar interpretations of one thing can kind of reconcile. As a disclaimer, I'm invested in crypto. I personally really like crypto but I've tried really hard to approach this from an objective analysis perspective. But do note that I might carry a little bit of bias just because I am a fan of the space. However, I do think there are some problems with it. I think most everybody knows that crypto has a narrative problem. This is pretty apparent to pretty much everybody. It's the divisiveness of different projects. It's the vitriol at brands for launching crypto integrations, the interpretation of the crypto bro persona, and of course, the general vibe underneath any NFT tweet. The general vibe is honestly pretty horrific at times where people appear to truly hate NFTs NFTs and to hate elements of the crypto ecosystem enough to wish people to unalive themselves, which is honestly awful. There was a video recently released called Line Goes Up, a video that really, really, really hits hard at crypto. It's a well-researched piece around the perception that people outside the crypto ecosystem have of those within. At times, the piece is way too harsh, becoming more attack versus analysis, but I think the core theme that Dan lays out is pretty important. Our systems are breaking or broken, straining under neglect and sabotage, and our leaders seem at best complacent, willing to coast out the collapse. We need something better, but a system that turns everyone into petty digital landlords, that distills all interaction into transaction, that determines the value of something by how sellable it is and whether or not it can be gambled on as a fractional token sold via micro auction, that's not it. A different system does not inherently mean a better system. Or more succinctly, buy in early and you could be the high-tech future boot. The video is correct in some spots, factually inaccurate in others, but the core thesis is what a lot of people agreed with. The core takeaway from a lot of the rebuttals to Dan's piece were basically like, yeah, we kind of recognize that things are not good, but they're going to get better one day. Tim O'Reilly wrote a really good piece about Web3 saying, if Web3 heralds the birth of a new economic system, let's make it one that increases true wealth, not just paper wealth for those lucky enough to get in early, but actual life-changing goods and services that make life better for everybody. Crypto isn't interpreted as true wealth right now. It's seen as a function of Ponzi's, of scams, of exploits, etc. It takes a lot of time for things to work, for systems to calibrate. And what Line Goes Up did a really good job at was distilling how people outside the crypto ecosystem see people within the crypto ecosystem. And the thing about narratives is that different people can read the same book and have completely different takeaways. I think what's most interesting about the current crypto debate is that the two camps are basically saying the same things, but in different voices. Dan outlines unhappiness with the system within his video, and that's also what crypto is about. Towards the end of the piece, Dan talks about opportunity shrinking, about isolation, about the future seeming to disappear before our very eyes, underscoring that crypto is not the answer here. But this is also what crypto talks about, making a better system. So why is there such a divide? Narratives. I'm also going to be making very broad generalizations, so please take everything with a grain of salt. People outside the crypto ecosystem, they say, wow, this kind of sucks. Why would this ever be the future when they see Ponzi's, when they see pump and dumps, when they see the honestly pretty absurd allocation of capital into different shit coins and say, how would the world ever be better off by embracing this? People within the crypto ecosystem see the same sort of things and they say, yeah, there is a world that exists beyond shit coins, but you know, shit stinks. It can be difficult to see beyond the shitty shit to see how crypto can and has changed lives, the potential power of ownership and meaning, and what the underlying technology can unlock in terms of efficiency and execution for archaic industries. But the issue is here is that everybody ends up talking past one another and growing increasingly furious as neither side understands the other. And this is where the overlap of the inside group and the outside group comes in. It seems like there's two distinct groups kind of fighting with each other. There's people who want freedom from the system in group number two. There's people who want money, which is crypto, finance people, venture capitalists, especially. Of course, there's crossover between the two groups. Money is a function of freedom. Freedom is a function of money. You can't really have one without the other. Both of them are about being able to make choices about what you want to make, spending time how you want to spend it, and engaging in things that you care about while knowing that you and your family are secure. Freedom is a function of time allocation, choice, and money, and money is a function of stability, freedom, and choice. And this makes sense. Most everybody is frustrated with this capital S system that we have as the comments under Dan's video and in various crypto discourse.
Discord's highlight. There's an increasing desire to be free from the 40 hours, 9 to 5 healthcare, 401k, retirement plan, commute 30 minutes lifestyle. Crypto is inherently an answer to that too. It's people at least trying to disrupt a system and make it on paper more fair, more accessible, and to shift the power distribution. But it's not interpreted that way, broadly speaking. There's two delineations of the narrative. There's crypto bad, which is hyper financialization, commodification, scam slash Ponzi, speculation, and group versus outgroup, environmentally disruptive. Then there's crypto good, creating ownership, market calibration slash policy, financial upside, community, environmentally life-changing, amplified by FOMO. I'm first going to discuss the crypto bad narrative from the lens of people who are like, crypto kind of sucks and I hate it. And then the crypto good narrative to underline what the differences in interpretations are. The crypto bad narrative. Those outside the ecosystem see five key things when they look at crypto. And these are, of course, extreme takes. Once again, use all the salt that you have in your covenant for this video. The first thing that they see is hyper financialization and commodification of your soul. Pay for everything and make everything a something to invest slash speculate on. Do we really need to make every single thing a microtransaction? Is it entirely necessary to break access into dollars and to have every aspect of our lives become yet another speculative market? A lot of people want to return to simplicity and crypto is not solving that right now. Point number two is scams slash Ponzi's. Scams are literally everywhere in crypto. Every time you turn around, somebody's losing their board ape, losing millions of dollars. Scams are a common denominator, both in web three and in web two. Ponzi-nomics are a whole different ball game where it's like, well, what is the intrinsic value of this thing? And it's like, if we all go in this thing, it'll go up. What? And that gets a little bit confusing at times, as one would imagine. Then there's speculation, point number three. We have a huge gambling problem in society. Crypto seems to encourage massive speculation, which is very hard to separate from gambling. Positive expected value, something like that, right? But the vibe is very much bet on this coin because Elon Musk might tweet about it, and if he tweets to the moon, the narrative is also a thread here between GME and AMC. Buy this thing and we'll all be rich. It's that easy. That doesn't feel good. That doesn't really do anything for society. And also, a lot of NFT art is just simply not good. It's just not good. Oh, you mean you get to go in early to an NFT project and you get to flip it on the secondary market? That's really good stuff. That's net positive for society. Then there's end group versus out group. You are not going to make it. This is broadly a function of end group versus out group in real life, where people who are inside look at the people outside and are like, you're never going to be one of me, so we're going to ignore you. Then it's environmentally destructive. The earth is already on fire, so why do we keep on doing this? Do we really want to accelerate the earth's demise so you can make $100 off a dog coin? And of course, crypto does put existing pressure on grids that are already pretty weak in Central Asia, etc. So the crypto bad narrative summarized, crypto is a microcosm of the world that it emerged from. It's very hard not to have the impact of legacy systems show up on new systems. And the current world looks like this to a lot of people. Unfair, unequal, destructive, there's a power imbalance, and crypto only makes that worse to many people. It's the badness of banks during the great financial crisis amplified, the destructiveness of Facebook multiplied, and the environmental destruction of oil producers dumping their product into the ocean intensified. It's the wide widening wealth gap, but saying the silent part out loud. Oh, I can buy a monkey for hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can't, oh, have fun staying poor. In a world where millions simply scrape by, it can feel really brutal to see that. That's just how a lot of people feel. We have a lottery society, but it's not hidden behind gas station tickets in crypto. It's laid out for the entire world to see and to brag about. It's getting rich from something that doesn't seem to make the world any better, which can feel kind of bad because the world is already kind of bad. The one sentence summary of crypto bad in the entire thesis of line go up is ultimately our systems suck. Making our lives speculative commodities isn't the answer. But on the flip side of that, the crypto good narrative. Crypto is not entirely like anything, right? Things are just an average. Before we get into this part, I think it's really important to highlight that there's different segments of crypto. There's the people who literally are just in there to make money. They're literally in there to scam. That's just life. And then there's people who are actually building real world use cases for this technology. They want to improve the lives of everybody. And I think it's important to delineate the two because some people in crypto suck. Like anything, there's bad and there's good. The first point that crypto good narrative sees is creating ownership. Through engaging with this thing, you get this token, which will enable you to benefit and own the things that you engage with. Tokenize to get the value from it. Simply benefit from being a person, which is kind of cool. And don't pay rent-seeking intermediaries. Decentralization. Get paid for the things that you do and build a better world because of it. Point number two is market calibration, where losing money is just in the process of learning. Rug pulls are kind of part of the game right now. If you invest in enough projects, you're going to get exposed to some sort of rug pull. People are always going 
going to tilt the table in their favors. That's not a good thing, but it's just how it is. Enough scams and people will hopefully learn over time, reducing scam effectiveness, which might take a little bit more time than people thought. Exploits are part of the game too, as we saw with the recent wormhole exploit, which is not good at all. And then there's Ponzi games versus Ponzi schemes. These are a little bit different because we're in the depths of MLMs in Web2. I know a lot of people who are selling skin products and that kind of stuff is going to show up in Web3 too. The core thesis boils down into if you hodl, we all hodl and we all get rich. It's that simple. <laughs> and most people know that that's not effective. More money come in, thing go up, doesn't really work over the long run. Then another important point around that is policy. Crypto people do want policy. They want good policy, but the issue is, is politicians don't understand the crypto space. So they're trying very hard to get regulated, but get regulated in the right way. Point number three is financial upside. You can make gobs of money in crypto if you're positioned correctly. You can also lose gobs of money too if you're positioned wrongly. Markets are two-sided interactions. So people see that and they say, well, why wouldn't I at least try to make some money. However, markets are two-sided interactions. It's a zero-sum game. Some people end up as exit liquidity. It's very similar to the antelope that runs slowest being eaten by the lion. And this isn't the main goal usually of different crypto projects, but it is a function of environment that moves fast and furious. You can also have fun with financial upside. Dune Analytics just raised $69,420,000 because they can, and of course life is a meme. A lot of crypto is around being ironic. Don't take yourself too seriously because at that point, you really just don't understand what this is all about. Then community. The value in crypto lies within the people in crypto. People build together, building amazing things, building things that scam people. And the common denominator in all of this is the concept of community. That's what crypto offers, a derivative of a religion, a place where you can feel like you're amongst people who value you and respect you. And then finally, the final point is environmentally life-changing amplified by FOMO. This piece is from Zeneca and it's around the concept of regret and missing out on certain trades. It does a really good job at encapsulating the FOMO that exists within the crypto ecosystem. Aw oh man, I didn't get in and thus all wealth will be lost to me, but it also highlights how much wealth is out there. And seemingly everybody is filming into crypto, at least embracing the environment. The lines between web two and web three are beginning to blur and innovation and investment are everywhere. So the crypto good narrative summarized. It's about access and opportunity, about creating paths for those that previously had none, about connecting the world to this common goal of truly owning things. It's about taking the power away from social platforms, selling the soul of your data to big ad. It's about David winning against Goliath to a certain extent, truly showing the power of God, crypto. It's about changing the world for the better, protect, own, benefit, take the widening wealth gap and shrink it, provide alternatives, don't allow the power dynamic to get so skewed that it's almost impossible to balance the scale again. The one sentence summary of crypto is good is our systems suck <laughs> and we can have a choice in how we choose to protect, own, and benefit from the world around us. So the interpretation of the narrative, both of those were extreme interpretations. I wrote about the narrative of Web3 a little bit ago. The problem with narrative interpretation of Web3 is it probably could be net beneficial for most people and that gets skewed because the narrative gets skewed. It could be perceived to be an equitable, cooperative, and accessible world, but it isn't. From an outsider's perspective, the narrative is not being translated in the right way. Most people still see crypto as a get-rich schema for an already rich person and that is not appealing. So it really boils down into two main threads. Some people see crypto as economic change where you can build better systems. Some people see it as Ponzi-nomics where it's a promenade of wealth and the rich are getting richer. It's always about perception. It's always about narrative. Everything at the end of the day is a byproduct of how people interpret it. If you zoom in on either argument, there are flaws to both. Everything has an element of nuance to it. Crypto is not perfect because nothing is. You can't have a perfect solution in an imperfect world. It just doesn't exist. The crypto ecosystem is a stacking of blocks and we can see narrative interpretation play out here. It's composed of brands, financial institutions, and more. This is narrative in action. Brands. Brands want to play, they want to make money, they want to be in the Nike metaverse, they want to become the metaverse themselves, which ends up hurting their earnings at the end of the day because it's quite the gamble. It's about testing out the ecosystem for Zuck, it's about controlling the ecosystem and figuring out how they can leverage technology and allow fans to engage alongside them. It's a function of relevance, how do we remain relevant in a world that increasingly hates us and the future. Attention is one of the most valuable commodities in the world. If you can figure out how to tap into that, you might be able to buy yourself more runway into the ever uncertain experience before us. And this can either go really well or really badly, but also it's confusing. Financial institutions. Traditional finance institutions and venture capitalists. Note this is a little bit separate than the conversation around regulation. This is just what TradFi and VCFi see as an opportunity. TradFi likes to make money. These guys know what they're doing. They've benefited from literally everything on the planet. They specialize in markets and finding discrepancies and truly making line go up. But yeah, they're going to be into crypto. Yeah, BlackRock's going to try to launch a blockchain ETF and yes, the spot ETF debate 
debate is going to continue into eternity. This is their DNA, derivatives, leverage, yield farming, etc. Well, of course they're going to be a part of it. Ontario's teacher pension plan just invested in FTX most recent round, a huge sign that the institutions are here, and they're here for a few reasons. Reason number one is yield. Bonds are essentially cash reserves at this point, getting eaten away by inflation. Some stocks have gone up a little bit too much and they go down a little bit way too much. So they say, hey, crypto does kind of trade like the NASDAQ, but it's not the NASDAQ. Let's invest. Then this gets into the concept of diversification. This holds hands with yields. Crypto is an answer to, wow, is everything actually Apple, Google, Facebook? No, crypto isn't. And so let's diversify. That makes things happy. Then there's financial upside. Yield is here too, but crypto has made a lot of people very, very rich. It's about number of occurrences, a couple odd bets here and there, and one could be a winner. Yeah, why wouldn't we? Is essentially the fundamental investing thesis of TradFi and crypto. Venture capital. This is a little bit different. VCs are a market floor right now. Dollars are flowing in, huge amounts of VC dollars, pushing projects up to 100 to $200 million valuations, pre-product, pre-idea, pre-pitch deck. Just have a token attached to it and don't worry, you'll have a seed round that envies anybody else's Series D or E or even IPO. VC is an interesting character in the space because they're sometimes the enemy, sometimes the friend, but the common denominator is that they're the financer. Millions and millions of dollars are going into Web3 slash crypto because of them. But the awkward slash necessary thing about VC is that they are seeking returns at the end of the day. They want to have an exit. They're not just throwing money for funsies. They can throw pasta at the wall and see what sticks, but at the end of the day, they want some sort of exit. This is return-driven investing backdrop by FOMO and hype. They're investing in crypto companies because one day there's the inherent expectation that this crypto company will someday make them money and some won't, but the one that does will make it all worth it. VC is speculative. It's either a bet on founders or the idea itself. And there are other influences too, including the Federal Reserve or really what the Federal Reserve stands for. This was very apparent over the past few weeks as the Fed announced that they would indeed be raising rates and that they were indeed serious this time and crypto and the stock market responded to that and all of a sudden crypto is no longer the diversification narrative that it used to be. The Fed announced that it was indeed time to tighten economic conditions and so people rotated into things like energy and utilities and crypto and tech stocks got really beat up. Of course there's been a rotation back for who knows why because we live in a loop but the market is really uncertain right now. We see that reflected in the VIX by muted inflows by just general market movement. Geopolitical risk aka Russia, general speculative bubble worries, is the economy actually doing okay? Things are pretty spicy to say the least. This is compounded by a few things, all of which impact crypto too. Energy markets are super important and I don't think it gets talked about enough with context to crypto. There's a fair amount of risk here that's under discussed, so rolling blackouts in Central Asia. What's going on in Russia doesn't really bode well for energy markets anywhere. Worries of underproduction, underinvestment, and resource constraints are strong. We can't have green energy policy without green energy investment. And that impacts crypto too. In fact, everything. <laughs> I think that's the most important phrase right now. You can't have green energy policy without green energy investment. And this gets into speculative dry up. So if energy prices start to inflate because we don't have green energy investment, really inflate, that works to execute the Fed's goals for them. That leads to a little bit of contraction in the economy because speculative dollars are funneled back into less speculative assets like energy markets, which deflates this entire speculative bubble. So that could be bad. The narrative summarized. Well, the point is that crypto is aware that it needs to improve. But the other point is that there's more overlap between crypto bad and crypto good than I think people give either side credit for. The way I see it combined is that point number one is yes, there's financialization of more things backdrop by elements of ownership and decentralization. And point number two, market calibration, scams are just an unfortunate constant because of human nature. Point number three, there's opportunity beyond speculation to actually have true investment. Point number four is community, the people in crypto do make crypto valuable, but there's also assholes everywhere. Avoid the assholes. And then point number five is environment. The world is on fire. We have to have sustainable energy. And this goes beyond crypto. This goes directly to policymakers. We have to think about life-changing opportunities, but we also have to think about life beyond the present moment. This is a rather subjective and qualitative analysis of the ecosystem because markets are both qualitative and quantitative. Markets are reflections of the world that we want to see maybe one day. Hopefully we invest in companies that we hope will do good things, but sometimes we don't because money. <laughs> Both inside and outside crypto, it's pretty clear that people are pretty unhappy with the direction the world is going. The fact that we're reverting back to coal production, the fact that we still have issues with workers' rights, the fact that we can't get healthcare figured out here in the United States, it's kind of like, well, is the world just a massive shit coin? Where do you find hope and meaning in a world that doesn't make any sense? We have two groups that are actually relatively similar in goals, but different interpretations of the narrative and the tech and the process that it takes to get there end up polarizing them. There's a lot that crypto can do to improve 
of its perception. Casey Newton highlighted some things, including making transactions more reliable, implementing scaling solutions, which people are already working on. Molly White talked about making the blockchain a little bit more private. But the biggest thing is that there's the hype part of the narrative and there's the reality part of the narrative. It's okay to focus on hype. That's how you get people excited. But at the end of the day, the reality is also important. Both crypto skeptics and crypto enthusiasts have valid points where hyper financialization to the point where we're paying to unlock our toothbrush, like Kobe pointed out, it's not great. But having an idea for how we can build a better future that allows for access, opportunity, and benefiting from previously very gatekept systems is pretty good. It's just about how it's perceived and ultimately implemented. Humans are always going to human. Like we're always going to not agree with each other. We're always going to not get along to a certain extent. But I think there's a lot of room for overlap and a lot of room for maybe a little bit of reconciliation between these two seemingly polarized groups that are actually more similar than they both think. So everybody, that was my video on crypto narratives. I hope you enjoyed it. Once again, it's very cold outside. So apologies for <laughs> being dressed like a polar bear. I have two pairs of socks on. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to go ahead and subscribe, thumbs up, like, share, that would be awesome. This is also in Substack form, so if you want to go read it, kyla.substack.com. As always, I'm on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. I'll be here. I hope that you're having a good day, and I will talk to you all soon. Bye.